In Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse number 8, it says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came in with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told uh, them concerning the child. And they and all that they uh, heard wondered at those things which were told of them by the shepherds. <clears throat> But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. I want to entitle the message this morning simply, Away in a Manger. Remember that old chorus song we sing, Away in a Manger, no crib for the bed, little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. Let me tell you, there is a way in the manger this morning. His name is Jesus. Praise God. To me, it's a wonderful thing that the announcement of the birth of Jesus Christ would be given and made to these lowly shepherds keeping their sheep in the fields of Bethlehem. Uh, in that day, the Orthodox people looked down upon the Jew. Uh, they were unable to keep the ceremonial rites. They could not keep the minute details of the law. They could not wash their hands. They couldn't do the rules. They couldn't do the regulations. And therefore, the Orthodox Jew uh, looked down upon them as a common class, underclass, low class of uh, uh, people. Uh, they were just simply a group of people. It was to these men and women, or these men rather, uh, in the fields of uh, Bethlehem, uh, caring for their sheep, uh, the angel appeared and said, The Lamb of God uh, has been born in Bethlehem this day. Had Jesus been born in the king's palace, you and I would have not had any access to him whatsoever. Uh, had Jesus been born into a rich and a powerful family, uh, we would not have any access to Jesus either. Uh, had Jesus been birthed into a home of wealth and of riches and notoriety, uh, we would have not had any access to him at all. But Jesus was born in a lowly home, a home made up of a young virgin girl, uh, to be uh, married to a man by the name of Joseph, who was a carpenter, uh, to a lowly household, if you will, and that because of that, he was born in Bethlehem's manger, placed, uh, born in Bethlehem, placed in a manger, and there, meaning we all can have access uh, to him today. It was, to me, a very simple man, lowly shepherds in the field, uh, watching their flock, that the angel came and said, the Lamb of God has been born. Now, why was this important uh, that the message came uh, to these shepherds? After all, it had been prophesied for hundreds of years uh, that Messiah would come. Isaiah said that he would be born through a virgin. Michael prophesied that he'd be born in Bethlehem. Uh, so why was it that the angel uh, came to shepherds watching their flock? Why did not the angel go to uh, maybe the priest of the, of, the, of the temple? Why did he not make the announcement uh, to the rabbi in the synagogue? Why not go to the scribes, the Pharisees, or the Sadducees? Or why not go to a political leader like Caesar or Herod? Uh, why make the announcement to the shepherds of all people? Well, I believe one of the reasons, if not many, that we know from reading the Word of God uh, that it was the shepherds uh, that would keep and watch over the flock. Why? Uh, because in sacrificial system of the Old Testament, uh, lambs had to be used over and over and over uh, within the sacrificial system of that uh, particular day and hour. We also know that the lambs that were used had to be without a spot, without a blemish. They had to be perfect as far as perfection could be in that day. With that being known, uh, the temple authorities had their own flock of sheep, if you will. And they think that they hired these particular shepherds uh, to keep those particular flock of sheep uh, that would be used in the sacrifice uh, there within the temple on
on a day-by-day -day basis. So it was to those particular shepherds keeping watch over a special flock of sheep, uh, the temple sheep, if you will, that the angel of the Lord appeared to and said, This day in the city of Bethlehem the Savior has been born. It fascinates me that the first eyes to behold God incarnate, God in the flesh upon this earth, were these lowly, unclean, uncommon shepherds uh, that the, the, the society of Judaism uh, kind of pushed out of the way. But as they went, uh, I believe it's like the angel says, you all have been watching sheep whose blood will be shed uh, to cover the sins of people. Uh, but the Christ child that I announce to you, I want you to see him and the blood that he will shed one day will not just cleanse the people of their sin, but will remove their sin as far as the east is from the west. And I think it's fitting that those shepherds uh, were able to see that for the very first time. When the shepherds arrived upon the scene, they may have been shocked. Uh, when they found out a little baby was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now I realize that's exactly uh, what the angel said they were fine, but in my thinking as a human being, I believe I would have expected a little bit more uh, than just a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes uh, lying in a feeding trough somewhere. Uh, think about it just for a moment. After all, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, sin's destroyer, and Satan's last, uh, uh, last uh, fear, if you will, uh, was the nightmare uh, was there as promised, a little baby in Bethlehem's manger. And it shall be a sign to you, they said, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. And I don't know about you, but it fascinates me that of all the ways for God to come to us, of all the ways for God to introduce himself to humanity, for all the ways for God to rid men of sin and rebellion, he chose through his wisdom uh, to come into this world as a baby. Uh, not as a man at that moment in a public ministry, uh, not as a king, not as a warrior, not as a prince, uh, not as some highfalutin political person, but he chose to come into this world uh, as a baby. He didn't come into the world with some uh, tall, handsome, uh, charismatic uh, person uh, like Samson of old, but he came in the form of a baby, a little, a little helpless a baby uh, that could not set up, uh, could not talk, uh, could not feed himself, uh, could not do any of those things whatsoever. And yet he came into the world uh, through the form of a baby, uh, susceptible to all the dangers and to all the diseases and everything that may come that way. And to make matters worse, uh, when Jesus was 12 years of age, Mary and Joseph lost him. They lost him at the temple for several days. The Son of God, the Savior, and they lose him. Why did the Lord choose to come in this way? Well, there are many reasons theologically, I'm sure. But I do believe with all of my heart today that this little defenseless baby came that way. For one thing, it allowed his life to be more accurately and historically proven and documented. We know everything about the birth of Jesus Christ. We know everything about it. We don't a lot, know a lot about his childhood and babyhood, but we do know and, uh, everything about him was documented. They could find nothing wrong with him. There's nobody could accuse him justifiably of doing anything wrong. Oh, they said he was a wine bibber. They said he was of the devil. But they can say all they want, but he lived to prove it to be different. So we have an accurate historical point of view of who this man Jesus Christ really was. And if he is not who he said he was, he is the biggest liar that ever walked upon the face of this earth. But we can trust that what he said he'll do, what he said he'll do, and what he did he's going to continue to do for his glory and his honor. I think one thing, too, he's better able to understand our human life as he came to this world as a baby. He understands just how fragile you and I are. He understands temptations better than we understand them ourselves. Why did Jesus come as a baby, a helpless, a little baby into the world? Well, maybe for different reasons. But number one, let me just simply say this. Babies, to me, represent life. Babies represent life. A baby represents so much, but for any of us that's been around the birth of a child, or for any of you ladies that's birthed the child, you know just how miraculous it really is. I uh, hear a uh, nothingness was formed in the womb of a mother, and the baby begins to grow, the belly begins to swell, and the baby's birth, and God breathes into the nostrils the breath of life. During that time, babies represent life. Babies represent hope. Babies represent newness. Babies represent promises fulfilled. Uh, babies represent opportunity, a new beginning, freshness. Babies uh, re represent uh, tomorrow and today, and also opportunities of God's promises being fulfilled. What better way for a Heavenly Father to give the gift of salvation and eternal life, but through a baby which can bring for us spiritual life as well. 
Not only that, but God understands human pain. And God understands suffering. God now cried, and he also laughed. He understands betrayal, and he understands loss. He understands persecution. He understands rejection. He knows what it's like to have your best friend to drop you like a hot potato. He knows what it's like when you've got people that sign up for commitment, sign up for a job, and then they go to switch, uh, sleep at the switch or they back out what they promised that they would do. He knows what it's like, my friend, to understand what it means to go through suffering as he bled and as he died upon the cross. He knows what it's like to stand by the hospital bed of someone that's sick. He knows what it's like to go to a graveside and cry with somebody that has died. He understands what it means through all these things. For in every point, he's been tempted like you and I. And yet we know he never sinned. No wonder the Bible said he's a friend of sinners. The writer of Hebrews said, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. I've got a thought this morning. You may not agree with me, and that's fine. This is my opinion. Say, this is pastor's opinion. Thank you. God cannot be tempted, neither can God tempt any man. How would God understand temptation had he not come in the flesh? How would God understand temptation? had he not come in the flesh. Many of us, not a one in this room has not sinned. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And even as Christians, you still sin. Now you can sit there a howl sanctimonious all you want, but I see your horn spinning on your halo. There's not a one in this room without sin. Not a one. We don't practice sin, but sin nature is in us and will be in us until the day we die. You can fast and pray, and you can pray fast, and you can go on a fast and lose so much weight you could choke yourself on your own belly button, but you will still have sin in you until the day you die. But if we sin, we have an advocate of the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but for the entire world. So if we sin, we've got a fire escape. Amen. Yes. But every one of us are tempted even as Christians. You know that. Think it not strange concerning the trial, the temptations that we go through. We have given in to them. I think of, of, of drug addicts. I think of people that are bound for pornography and that lust and that drawing power. I think of people that are alcoholics that have one more drink, one more drink, and we try, we try to quit, and we just keep growing to it. We give in to those temptations people do. But what about Jesus? Every temptation known to humanity, he was drawn into it, but every time he stopped it short of committing the sin. He understands the totality of temptation to the max. We go so far and cave in. So I suggest again, had Jesus Christ not come in the flesh, God may have not understood. Now God can do anything, understand that, but God would not really, in my opinion, understand what temptation is all about. He can't tempt, neither does he tempt any man. So I'm grateful that I have a Savior today that's touched by my infirmities. He knows the pulling upon you for the lust of the flesh. He knows the pulling of the lust of the eye. He knows the pulling of the prod of life. But He gives us the grace and the mercy to turn our back on it and walk away. Satan does not hold a gun to your head and say, Now, sinner, I'm going to pull the trigger. We can say, Get behind me, Satan. And the flesh dies hard, does it not? But Jesus understood that all the way. Yes. Praise God for that this morning. God in the flesh, divinity housed in a man. Thank God he understands temptations more than we ever will. He overcame everything thrown his way as a man, not as God, but as a man anointed of the Holy Spirit. People say, well, he overcame as God. If Jesus overcame the temptations as God, we don't have a snowball's chance in Florida on the 4th of July of making it. But Jesus Christ was tempted as a man. He overcame as a man full of the Holy Spirit of God and saturated with God's Word. Get thee behind me, Satan, again and again and again. We have the same resources at our disposal today. Jesus Christ carried our sins to the cross. He buried them in the tomb, praise God. And he came out of that grave victoriously. Yes, Jesus Christ was born in the brightness of Bethlehem's star but he died under a black night of God's judgment. For sin must be judged, and Jesus Christ took yours and mine and judged them upon that cross. Babies represent life. Secondly, I believe families are important to God. 
God in His wisdom chose Jesus Christ to be birthed into a family. Family is the oldest institution in all the world, and families are coming under attack today like never before. Totally under attack. But I remind you that God knows that families can provide support. Families provide encouragement. Families give the discipline that's needed. Family gives love that's needed for us to become whole and healthy. God chose Jesus, the Savior of the world, to be raised by a little teenage mother by the name of Mary, who was engaged to a man by the name of Joseph, who no doubt taught Jesus a work in the carpentry field, who had other siblings brought to him. And I, what, do you, what do you think it would be like to, get, to be raised with Jesus? Can you imagine civil, uh, sibling rivalry? Can you imagine the tricks they played on each other? Can you imagine how Jesus responded to it? Jesus was the only person smarter than his mom and dad, and he still obeyed them. Yeah. That'll hit you about 2 o'clock in the morning. Jesus was not born as an orphan. He wasn't thrust into a place all alone and forgotten. No, he was born in the families, and families are important to God. Let me tell you something. For those that don't have perfect families, guess what? None of us do. There's no such thing as a perfect family. There are some people that are born and families don't want you. You've been adopted. You've been given up. You've been rejected. The list goes on. I'm afraid. You and I cannot ha help what's happened to us. But we can help how we're going to respond to what happened to us. If we go around acting like a martyr, I told somebody the other day, if we go around acting like a martyr, there'll be people that are crucify us. You may have been rejected by mom. You may be rejected by dad. You may be rejected by everybody. But I'm going to tell you, you can come to the family of God because we have a heavenly father. He keeps his eyes upon the sparrow. He loves everything about you. He knows that you were fearfully and wonderfully made and the world may reject you. A mom may reject you. A dad may reject you. But the Lord Jesus Christ, the glory, died for you and he will accept you into his beloved today. Don't you say you don't have a family. You've got the family of God and we have a heavenly father who will meet every need that we have today. Amen. Glory to God, we have a heavenly Father whose eye is upon you this morning. I love that Jesus came as a baby. He didn't come in a cloud. He didn't come in a pillar of fire. And I love the fact that my king humbled himself and came in the form of a baby to enter into this world. This is known, God dwelling in the flesh Divinity housed in a man. This is known as the incarnation. Now, I didn't say reincarnation. I said known as the incarnation. The incarnation of Jesus Christ is an important doctrine in Christian theology. God becoming flesh in the form of a baby. John covers this in his chapter, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father. The incarnation really has nothing to do with Christmas. Oh. We simply remember the incarnation at Christmas. That's the day we remember it. When Jesus was born, they did not celebrate birthdays. His parents used, did not use a Roman calendar 365 days. They used the 360-day calendar. So we have one day out of 365, and we may get it right when he was born. But he wasn't born on December the 25th. We acknowledge the fact that he was born, and we celebrated on December the 25th. I hope that don't hurt you. Somebody may have written down the day he was born, but if they did, they lost it. It's safe to say he was not born on the 25th of December. That's the day we remember his birth. So let's instead focus on the incarnation of Jesus Christ. After all, all this birthday stuff is just a distraction from what he did and what he means to us. It's not about gifts and toys and trees. That's what we made it. But friends, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about God seeing a condition upon this earth. It's about God hearing the cries of mothers and fathers and people bound by sin. It's about God saying, I'll come down in person and do something about it. He didn't send an angel. He came himself as a virgin born son of the living God. It was a day when the son of God became the son of man in order that we as sons and daughters of men might become the sons of God. It's the day that he stepped out of eternity into time to redeem us in time that we might be ready for eternity. That's what Christmas is about to me. I'm pretty sure the incarnation of Jesus has nothing to do with having his birth celebrated by giving each other gifts financed by debt. It's amazing. We celebrate Jesus' birthday, but we give everybody else the gifts. 
My four-year-old granddaughter and my seven-year-old grandson, we celebrate birthdays with family. I know them enough to know that if it's my seven-year-old son, grandson's birthday and we buy all the gifts for the four-year-old, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> we are going to have a major problem. It's my birthday. As a matter of fact, when it's their birthday, they want each other's presents. They want to blow the candles on each other's birthday. You know what I'm talking about. That's the way kids are. Sometimes we as Christians just the same way. Pastor, you're thinking out loud again. <laughs> the wise men came to Jesus. They brought gifts of myrrh and gold and frankincense. Understand that. But friends, it's not about the trees and the tinsels. It's about Jesus. It's not about, not about the lights and the star on top of the tree. It's about Jesus. It, it, it's not about uh, the gifts under the tree and, and all these things. It's, it's about Jesus. Celebrate it the way you want to. Enjoy the beautiful decorations. Enjoy the beautiful colored lights. Enjoy the lighted stars and the nativity scenes. Enjoy the eggnog and the fruit cakes and the parades and the parties. But friend, don't forget about Jesus. Amen. Enjoy your turkey and ham dinner on Sunday, Christmas. Don't forget about Jesus. Enjoy all the festivities that you do and the gifts that you give to friends, family, and loved ones. Nothing wrong with that. But don't forget about Jesus. And if you have to, go on out there and take your kids to the mall and let them sit on a little fat red man's fa uh, lap and, and, and pull on his whiskers and look at the sleigh and the reindeer and all that. But don't forget about Jesus because we're celebrating Jesus who came into this world. God indeed did come to this earth. He was 100% man. He was 100% God. He was divinity housed within a man, praise God. The shepherd's eyes were the first one to see the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. The shepherds were the first one to see the one who came to destroy the works of the devil. The shepherds were the first one to see God's love gift to a lost and dying world. The shepherd's eyes were the first to see the one who came to give life and to give that life more abundantly. And thank God that he, they, they saw and they beheld with their own eyes. Amen. Referring to the incarnation, the Bible said, but as many received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. John 1, 9, that the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The good news is that salvation is personal. It's for me. It's for you. But don't forget it's for the world. It's not just for us. It's for everyone. The atonement is not limited. Jesus did not die for a certain few. He died for everyone. For God so loved some of the world. No, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And yet he's become his only forgotten son in so many cases today. Think about the physics of bringing light to a dark room for a second. Let's just say we're at a theater. 200 people or so in, in, the, in the theater. And the projector behind you is going up on the big huge screen. It's still dark in there. But say all of a sudden the film breaks and a white light hits the screen. Guess what happens? The whole theater is bright. Yes. Now that white light, did it just affect the people looking for it or did it affect everybody? It affected everybody. When Jesus Christ came into this world, the light of the world Christ influence the entire world whether people like it or not. Sure. Jesus came. You can't stop that fact. You can't eradicate history. You cannot revisit history. You cannot redo the history. It's a fact that he came into this world. And it's a fact that when he came, the light has been shed. And the light still shines today through the auspices of his church. The light still shines uh, through the salvations he gives. The light still shines through the healing of the manifested. The light still shines of every darkness that's broken down, every wedge that's come down, every dream that's fulfilled, every promise that's been made whole. The light still shines and the world can't put him out. Amen. And the truth of the matter is today, that baby lying in the manger, everybody in the room is experiencing some sort of benefits from the light that was born that day. Amen. Our major institutions and colleges were founded to train clergy. Hospitals were based upon the, the caring acts of the Lord. Our government in America based upon the word of the living God. Cities are named after biblical names. You can't get rid of the light. Amen. You can put a basket over your head and try to hide from him. You can go to the dark dens of sin all you want to with the light of God's love still rings in the hearts and lives of men and women because the candle's not going to go out as long as Jesus Christ is alive and he is alive forever and as long as the church is in this world. 
So we think about the incarnation of Christ, what do we think about it? What does it mean that Jesus brought light to a world? Well, I'm grateful that Jesus is willing to walk in my shoes and experience the life that I leave. Thank God he walks where I walked. He's tempted like I was tempted, but I choose to serve God, and I'm thankful he gives me the ability to do so today. And he changed my life forever. Amen. That baby lying in the manger has changed my life for time and for eternity, and he's done it for you. And if you don't know him, he can change it for you for the better as well. Now, what's your view of why Jesus came as a baby? What do you think about Christ? What are you thankful for for Christmas? Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. Friend, there is a way in the manger. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. There's a way to have life more abundantly. It's in Jesus. There's a way to get rid of your sin. It's in Jesus. There's a way to get rid of your guilt. It's in Jesus. There's a way to get rid of your condemnation. It's in Jesus. Thank God there's a way to have peace and experience the peace of God. It's in Jesus. There's a way to have joy in a world that drains your world every day. It is in Jesus. Thank God there's a friend that'll sit closer than a brother. It's Jesus. Uh, there's a God that said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. It is Jesus. And there's a God that said, I've gone away and prepared a place for you and I'll come again. And that is Jesus. Jesus this morning and there's someone only a prayer away that will give you companionship for your loneliness strength for your weakness and encouragement for your discouragement it's not all it's not Buddha but thank God it is Jesus God the creator of this universe he left glory of heaven became like one of us without becoming in our sins and thank God he was able to save us the incarnation includes bringing the good news to everybody Jesus came to the world for us. He came to the so-called high and the mighty and to the low and those on skid row. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or the influence of your kin. It doesn't matter uh, whether you're rich or poor. Jesus Christ will still come knocking on your door any day of the week if you but open up your heart and allow him to come in. Friend of mine, God that created the universe left the glory of heaven. He became one of us without partaking of our sin without partaking of our debauchery. At the same time, he remained God in order to love us, to forgive us, to sanctify us, to accept us, and one day to glorify us in heaven with him. Praise God. What a plan. What a salvation. What a God. What power. Destroying the works of the devil. The baby wrapped in clothes grew up to be a man. On every occasion... He defeated everything that came his way. He overcame sin by becoming sin. He overcame death by dying. He overcame the grave by saying, I freely lay my life down, I freely pick it up again. He overcame every obstacle. He overcame every problem. He defeated every foe. No disease is a match for his power. Uh, every disease could not hinder him or his healing power to be manifested. His power on earth, no power on the underworld could ever stop or destroy him. There's not a problem he can't solve. There's not a tear he cannot dry. And there's no burden that he cannot lift. And I rejoice this morning by knowing there's no sinner he can't save. And there's no prodigal that he cannot rescue. We serve a God who loves us and is near.